Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, you're very welcome to this, the, the fifth International Symposium of Oceans in National Income Accounts. Um, I'd just like to welcome you on behalf of SEMRU, uh, the Whishkar Institute, the National University of Ireland Galway and the EU uh, MOSES project. Uh, my name is Stephen Hines. I'm a professor of economics here at NUI Galway. Um, and uh, I'm delighted uh, uh, to be with you again today. Um, I'm also director of the Socioeconomic Marine Research Unit here at NUI Galway. Uh, so some of you will know our work, uh, that's in particular our work, I suppose, in relation to uh, the compilation uh, uh, and research on ocean economy statistics and, and the compilation of, of, of those statistics for Ireland. Uh, it only seems, I suppose, like yesterday when, when we, I was at the last iteration of this event in, in Qingdao, China. Um, that was October 2019. So uh, at that point, I agreed that we would host the next uh, symposium in Galway uh, the following year. And so it was supposed to be in, in uh, September 2020. But uh, obviously, uh, things, things happen, <laughs> and uh, we tried to push it out as far as we could. We, and uh, we said, we, surely things will be back to normal uh, by 2021. But unfortunately, uh, it became pretty evident towards the end of 2020 that we were still going to have to, uh, we're gonna, uh, the, we're gonna have to host it online. So we had built, even, we had built uh, the symposium in as something we would uh, undertake as part of our, the EU MOSES project um, at the start when we applied for funding um, from the EU. Uh, so it was because it was very much tied to what was going on with that project. On the plus side, it's a virtual event, but on the plus side, this is the first time the symposium has opened up to a much wider audience. In the past, it would have been just those practitioners uh, involved to the speak. Uh, the speakers at, at, at the event. So it's great to have been able to open it up to a much wider audience. And we have over, we have over 200 uh, people registered uh, for, uh, for the event, which is fantastic. Um, so, you know, we've, it's a fantastic lineup uh, today. Um, we're, we're covering all topics in relation to the oceans in national income accounts. So looking at the recent, most recent developments in national standards for ocean and related industry classification, um, looking at the satellite accounting for ocean economic activities, uh, looking at the development of uh, new and interesting tools for improved usage of ocean economy statistics, uh, looking as, as well at the exciting area of uh, ocean natural capital accounting, uh, where there's a lot of interest in that at the moment, and in the associated incorporation of marine ecosystem service uh, benefit values into national income account frameworks. Uh, and, and we have a special session tomorrow morning as well, looking at the, you know, at the key policy drivers that need these improved ocean economy statistics and indicators. Uh, so it's a really excited, exciting lineup. Uh, and as I mentioned, the symposium has been run as part of the EU MOSES pro uh, project. Uh, so I just want a, a word on, to say a word on that. MOSES stands for Maritime Ocean Sector and Ecosystem Sustainability. Bit of a mouthful. Uh, but it involves eight partners from across the five Atlantic uh, area member states, so uh, uh, France, Portugal, Spain, uh, the UK and ourselves. It's funded by the EU uh, Interreg Atlantic Area Programme uh, and, and we're grateful to them for providing the funding for, for, for today's event. Um, just in terms, the key objectives of MOSES was really to to again, uh, to estimate uh, uh, the size and growth of key maritime industries uh, across the Atlantic Arc member states, and if possible to do it at a level below the national level. Uh, so to paint that picture, and we were building on a previous project. So we were using uh, the Marnet uh, framework, which was a, Marnet was a previous uh, uh, Atlantic area inter, inter project. Uh, but as well as that, we wanted to go beyond just looking at the, the basic uh, output statistics and employment numbers. And to see, to, could we come up with some sustainability indicators? And with that in mind, we were also uh, assessing sectoral pressures on the marine environment across the Atlantic region, assessing the vulnerability of coastal areas and, and the marine environment uh, to those marine sector pressures. And we had a number of case studies across the, the partners, co countries uh, focused in on particular marine industries. Uh, and, and it's trying to examine what, uh, and to demonstrate sustainable trans transition uh, pathway, pathways for growth for those uh, uh, industries. And we have a session 
uh, later today. Uh, the last session today will, will be very much focused on those tr transition pathways dedicated to, to those Moses, Moses case studies. Um, so yeah, and the outputs are peppered throughout the uh, symposium from the project. Uh, and you can see those, you know, those objectives, they're very much uh, in line with the themes of the, conf conf of the symposium. And, and that was why we wished uh, to, to host it on, on behalf of the project. Um, and as well as that, uh, you can see from the agenda, we've got some of the key people and institutes putting together ocean economy statistics and developing marine accounts uh, from across the globe, including, you know, colleagues in the EU Commission, uh, OECD, the People's Republic of China, South Korea, the US, Canada. So it's, it's truly a, an international overview of the latest developments in the area. Uh, and and I'm, I'm really grateful for everyone's time and efforts in that regard. Um, uh, in particular, uh, for, for those who are, really, are, you know, are operating outside their uh, office hours. Uh, I, I see Ethan here in front of me. Uh, he's, uh, it's 5 a.m. with him. Uh, but and and it's outside office hours as well for whaling who will be on the first session. So I'm really grateful for everyone for for the effort they've put in, uh, and obviously with different time zones, it's not easy trying to to uh, to have everyone uh, in in this uh, trying to coordinate the sessions to suit everyone. So thanks for everyone's cooperation on that. Um, for those of you active on social media, uh, we are using the hashtag hashtag Ocean Accounts. Uh, so please, yeah, do add that to any comments you're making on, on any of the social me media platforms that you're using. Uh, and as well as that, uh, please uh, use the Q&A uh, function uh, as an audience member to, to, for any comments or questions that you might have for us uh, as, uh, throughout all the sessions. Um, so yeah, so look, at it's a packed lineup. I'm not going to keep you much longer. Uh, Le I'm really looking forward to hearing all the sessions uh, uh, taking place today. Uh, in particular, personally, I'm really interested in, in hearing the work, the, the re most recent work going on with the satellite accounts and the, the ocean natural capital accounting efforts taking place across the globe. That's something that we here in Ireland, uh, ourselves in partnership with uh, the Irish Marine Institute, are really interested in, in doing more with over the coming years. Um, uh, and it's such, a, obviously, with all the policy developments, it's such a, the, the push uh, to take into account both physical and monetary changes in our marine natural capital is, is so important. Um, so look at this symposium, has, it's come a long way since uh, the first one held back in Monterey in California back in, I think it was 2015. Uh, back then we were just struggling, I suppose, with the, you know, the definitions of, of the ocean economy uh, industries and, and trying to build uh, collaboration as, so that we could uh, compare uh, industry statistics across the, the different countries uh, working in this area. Um, but, you know, I, I suppose for a long time, we would have uh, all be, we would have looked towards this uh, center of the blue economy, in particular, Charlie Colgan, and, and I'm thinking of his colleagues, uh, Judy Kildow, they were at the forefront of, of developments in this area and really were, were some of the, uh, Charlie was one of the first people to, to uh, you know, to be highlighting the importance of developing better statistics for our ocean economy and, and how, why we needed them and how we should go about producing them. Uh, so I think I know a lot of us would consider Charlie as the godfather of uh, this research area. Uh, and he's always been very helpful in terms of uh, advice for the rest of us who have been uh, struggling, I suppose, to, to get up and running uh, with our own national ocean economy statistics. Uh, so I'm, I'm delighted he's here with us uh, for this uh, event uh, and he's, uh, he's going to provide some op open comments as well on the, I suppose, on the evolution of the work in this area and on, on the symposium. Uh, so like I said, Charlie, he's a, a professor from the Centre of the Blue Economy in the Middleburg Institute of International Studies in Monterey. Uh, like I said, it's great that, you know, he, he's, he's been working in this area for a long time, but he, and he continues to be at the the forefront of, of developments in, in this area. So before we start the session, I'm gonna, at the first session, I'm gonna, I'd like to hand over to Charlie uh, and ask him to provide some, some opening remarks. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Stephen. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, middle of the night, whichever applies. Um, <clears throat> uh, as Stephen said, I'm with the uh, Center for the Blue Economy, which is at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies in Monterey, uh, California. Uh, however, for the last year, I've been social distancing at my home in South Portland, Maine, um, which is where I'm speaking to you from this morning. So it's not two o'clock in the morning here. Um, 
yeah, the, the, the first of these symposia uh, five years ago was really the brainchild of my long standing colleague and friend, Judy Kildow. Um, our center had been founded on some work that I had done on creating an ocean accounting system for the US and Judy decided it was time to get the world involved. <clears throat> um, I have to say that uh, in putting that conference together, we had to spend an awful lot of energy just finding people um, to come to Monterey and be interested in this subject. And the fact that we've got 200 people volunteering to show up at some or all of this conference is a remarkable tribute to the growth in the interest in this area. Um, of course, the work goes back way before um, the uh, starting of the symposium series. The first ocean accounting, national ocean accounting um, that I know of was in 1974 uh, with the Nathan Associates report to the U.S. government, to the uh, Bureau of uh, Department of Commerce. I did my first study in, here in Maine in 1977, and it's progressed with fits and starts to the end. I think the one thing that's remarkable and that has been a big driver is this global attention to the blue economy and the idea of the ocean as a source of newfound wealth, but a challenging source because of the um, sustainability problems that we all recognize. And all of a sudden, for one reason or another, governments and others have taken on this blue economy idea and said, oh, let's do that, whatever that is. Um, and I think our major contribution in this ocean accounting work has been to say, okay, here's a way to think about what the blue economy is. Here's a way to think about knowing whether you uh, are um, undertaking the um, elements of a blue economy and whether you're making progress towards or away from sustainability. That's a, uh, that's a pretty big demand. Um, and it's enormously complex as everybody who dives into this field quickly finds out. Uh, <clears throat> so this symposium is really a, a reflection of the evolution. The end of the last symposium, I basically said, well, we're really making progress on these core ocean accounts and definitions of industries. And the next generation is going to start looking really at the, uh, the, the UN environmental and economic accounts and the ecosystem service accounts. And that's pretty much the way it's evolved. Um, much more interest in, though still quite a bit of struggling with, um, how to do uh, the, the integration of the environment and ecosystems and laying just over the horizon hull down is the integration of uh, such uh, concepts as uh, human capital and social capital um, <clears throat> uh, that we are probably gonna be moving into in the next five years to expand the concept of ocean accounting. <clears throat> so we made a lot of progress, got a lot more people interested in it, a lot more people doing it, and the good news is that uh, the demand for our work, I think, can only uh, extend and increase. <clears throat> um, and we're going to have to get together periodically somewhere, even if it's in Zoom world, uh, to keep uh, the progress going. Um, so I really appreciate Stephen and Galway um, stepping up to the plate here and continuing with the tradition that we began five years ago. Thanks, Charlie. Just that's great. Just trying to unmute myself there again. That that was fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, those introductory remarks. So I think we're, we're ready to to start uh, the first session. And I suppose this the first session, um, first session is maybe harking back to the, to to the, that, those original that original symposium. In that it, it, the focus will be on the the uh, output the the production accounts, looking at output employment and, and how how the country how different countries have been putting together uh, those statistics and the and most recent developments uh, therein. Um, so we, we have uh, and we're going to hear from uh, the, the, the EU, the uh, 
People's Republic of China, uh, South Korea, uh, and uh, in the in the US, we're going to hear about uh, uh, a, a new a new tool, I suppose you could say you'd call it for for showcasing uh, this data in a more user friendly manner. Uh, so, uh, so really uh, delighted to have have uh, this all the, the speakers in this first session with us. Um, and our, our first uh, speakers in this in the session are our colleagues in the direct. Uh, Director General, General of Maritime Affairs and Fisheries in the European Commission. Um, uh, we've been, you know, we uh, so those of us who have been putting together ocean economy statistics for individual countries can only uh, pulling our hair out can only marvel at uh, at the work that has gone on in the in the DG Maritime Affairs. They've been trying to do it for all member states, all coastal member states. So it's uh, it's been a huge undertaking, and they've been producing now uh, on an annual basis. They're they're. Uh, Blue Economy uh, reports uh, for all member states. So it's a, 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 an amazing undertaking, an amazing body of work. And we're going to hear uh, a bit more about that, uh, the, the EU Blue Economy framework. So I'm delighted to, to, to welcome uh, Yasmin uh, Shinsi uh, Romero uh, and her colleague Angel Calvo uh, Santos uh, from DG Maritime Affairs and Fisheries. In the, in the European Commission to talk to us in that regard. Yasmin is a policy economic analyst at the U European Commission uh, DG Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, uh, where she's been working for the last four years. And, and Angel is, is the team leader on the economic analysis team. And I know we've spoken a number of times in the past with them uh, and we've uh, hashed, trying to hash out uh, some of the issues that we all face in trying to get these statistics together. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to, I think it's Yasmin, Yasmin, Yasmina first uh, to, to kick us off. So you can share your screen there, Yasmina. Thanks. Yes, uh, I'll share my screen. I think Anka is going to start off, but um, I'll be sharing my screen. So just uh, bear with me a second. <laughs> yes, colleagues. So my colleague Yasmin is preparing the joint presentation. So first, I would like to thank you. Thank you very much for everything that you are doing. Uh, you are for us inspiration, because thanks to your work and the analysis that you are developing, we are able to, to collect and to gather this information, at least for the European Union. So I represent, together with Jasmine, the economic analysis team uh, in the GIMARE. Uh, in this presentation, um, in this presentation, we'll try to, to, to inform you what we do when it comes to the blue economy in the European Union, and also to, to tell you how we use the statistics, the analysis, uh, to inform our policy making. So next slide, exactly. So a quick online on the, on the presentation, on this joint presentation between Jasmine and myself. So first, I will be telling you uh, what we do. Huh? and why uh, we use this economic analysis for supporting our analysis. Then we will focus in our flagship exercise, uh, the EU Blue Economy Report. And then we will discuss the key figures, trends, and also the methodology, which is the fundamental question here uh, to, to, to try to get uh, further advanced. Then we will be looking at the established sectors, uh, the, the emerging sectors and the difficulties that we have there, and also next steps, eh, right? The, for example, the evaluation of ecosystem services. Uh, then my colleague uh, Jasmine will be focusing mostly on the process, uh, priorities, and of course, next steps. So, um, what we do? Um, well, the economic analysis unit really needs data. That's why all this story starts with uh, the data that we collect from the member states. We normally launch uh, once per year a data call uh, to the member states, uh, European Union member states, where we get information, uh, for example, on the fishery sector or culture or fish processing. And this data goes through a process of data validation. For us, it's fundamental to, to ensure that the data has the quality uh, that, we need, that we need to support our policy analysis. That's why there are different steps of uh, data validation. One, uh, first is at the level of member states, and then uh, the data is processed by our colleagues at the Joint Research Center. The Joint Research Center is the, the commission service that uh, has the expertise uh, to support in this uh, endeavor, in this task. And together with the ECCF, the Scientific 
Technical and Economic uh, Committee of Fisheries of the European Union, which is a body of independent experts in the EU, we develop and we produce some uh, reports and analysis on our uh, most important blue economy sectors. And now, once we have the endorsement, once we have the, the validation on the quality and, and the analysis, is when we uh, develop our policy analysis, when we apply these findings into the policy making. And, here, and there you can see some examples. This is, for example, for the, for the fishery sector. And then you can see that the analysis uh, and the data that we have been collecting and gathering is used, for example, for example to support the impact assessment, uh, to assess the scenarios of different um, conservation policies. And then we try to compare the short-term losses with long-term gains. And this is a very important uh, analysis in, in, in natural resource economics. Then, of course, we use these assessments for um, uh, helping um, member states in implementing structural policies. And also this analysis, and also is confirmed what the previous speaker said, there is an increasing demand. Uh, this analysis is also used for other international organizations, FAO, OECD, to uh, inform part of the policy uh, proposals that they put forward. So next slide, please. So the Blue Economy Report, this is our flagship, eh? our main exercise uh, when it comes to monitoring the blue, economy, the blue economy in the European Union. Here we have four objectives eh? uh, to, for this exercise. First, we try to have an overview of the EU blue economy based on the latest available data. Uh, of course, this, has, this data has to be the highest quality possible, right? Then we like to, we, we intend to have an accurate monitoring of the blue economy over time, building the trends, identifying new opportunities for investors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Of course, we want that this report uh, becomes the reference uh, uh, for facts um, and figures in the European Union, which is something really difficult, as you know. Huh? Um, for us, it's fundamental to achieve comparability and consistency across member states and across sectors. But then we will discuss a little bit more on that, on the methodology. And then, of course, um, from a uh, manager's perspective, we like that this exercise, that this product uh, brings value uh, for policy making and stakeholders. So, next slide, please. Voila. So, here uh, we have the key figures, the key numbers for the blue economy based on our blue economy report. Uh, the turnover for the EU27 uh, amounts to uh, 650 billion with a gross value added of uh, 176 billion, uh, a gross profit of 68. Employment is uh, close to 5 million, and we are only taking into account the direct employment, uh, because the indirect, and we are working on that, uh, through multipliers is, is a difficult task for us. So this is really important. Uh, uh, for uh, some member states, Mm, the blue economy represents a fundamental share of the of the national uh, accounts, and for some maritime regions in the EU, these uh, sectors are are, are really uh, uh, critical. Uh, yes, in this uh, in this uh, infographics, you can see the main sectors that we are covering, and we follow the traditional uh, the usual classification between established uh, sectors and uh, emerging sectors. Um, next slide, please. And here, once we enter in the established sectors, we have the same, the, the, the first problem, right? Um, here we are using the NACE code. Mm -hmm. The NACE stands for the nomenclature of economic activities in the statistical system of the European Union. Uh, these NACE codes ensure that we have a comparable uh, um, comparability and consistency across uh, member states and across sectors. Uh, this, uh, this system is also in turn um, uh, similar or reflects the uh, standards from the uh, United Nations International Standard Industrial Classification of Economic Activities. Um, 
And uh, we can say that thanks to this uh, comparability, uh, we can also uh, ensure certain degree of comparability, at least for the higher level of, of codes uh, at, at international level. But uh, as you know, uh, these uh, codes don't, don't really fit in certain, in certain cases for the, to capture the, 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 the total uh, size of the uh, blue economy in the European Union. And that's why, and the problem is because some of these sectors uh, include both uh, the maritime component, but also the non-maritime component. That's why we need to have some, uh, some splits and some information to, to, to correct, to factor in for the uh, maritime contribution. And this is a difficult word. Uh, uh, this requires your expertise, uh, your knowledge, and thanks to that, we are able to use these uh, splits and try to, to, to get a, a better view of the uh, established sectors. Um, next slide, please. And of course, I was telling you that, uh, at least from our perspective, we want to build policy messages based on this economic analysis report on the, on the, on the blue economy. And here, there is one of our main policy messages that we have in this report. Here, you can see the trends in the uh, gross value added per uh, fishing vessel. Huh? This focuses more, mostly on the living resources, money living resources. And then on the other hand, you can see uh, the trends for the um, fishing mortality. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in a way that uh, we see uh, that um, as um, the, the, the reduction in fishing mortality, the reduction in fishing effort uh, makes uh, progress, we also see uh, 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 an increasing trend in the, in, the, in the performance, in the value added per uh, fishing vessel in the European Union. And that's very important because when we saw that to our fishermen and also to our stakeholders, they realized that here there is a, the message that conservation pays off is important. And that's why we use this data, this evidence from the blue economy to support our policy making. But there is more to say. And now Jasmine will be informing you about the next steps in margin sectors and how we continue our work. Jasmine, up to you. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I unmuted myself. Um, so, so Angel covered most of the, the established sectors. I guess I'll say a few words on the emerging sectors and sort of what we're doing beyond that. Um, so at the moment in, in the report that will be published um, soon, we cover eight emerging sectors um, and they include um, renewable energies, especially as regards well ocean energy, um, so waves and tidal, desalination, blue bioeconomy, research, observation, infrastructure, defense and security. Um, so the list is quite long. Um, and how we choose to categorize these, these sectors is important because some of these sectors are in fact quite new, quite niche, and that's why we call them emerging. Other sectors such as maritime defense are not new at all. But we find that because there's a, there's a real lack of data, uh, certainly at an EU level, and because the data are only emerging, we also place those under the sort of the emerging category. Um, and of course, our efforts focus on, on trying to give a good um, and sort of overarching picture of the blue economy. And for that, we try to add um, all the sectors that are relevant. We try to gather as much data as possible, which is not always easy for these sectors but that's sort of the goal under that um, and then in the latest in the last report that we published last year and certainly in the one that we're about to publish um, we want to go a little beyond that so the the report is evolving and so we've tried to cover um, sort of ecosystem services and in, in the value of these um, and we've also started looking uh, uh, more in detail and certainly with the help and the support of, of the JSC on the socioeconomic impacts of, of climate change and the climate change related issues. So to have sections um, that cover CO2 emissions, um, we're looking at the sort of the costs and benefits of, of adaptation to sea level rise um, and sort of topics that are, that are actually quite important right now. Um, 
And as I was saying, we work closely with the JSC. Um, they do a lot of modeling. They um, also work on improving a lot of the methodologies that we have already. Um, so there's a, a key study that they're working on um, to assess, um, as I was saying, the sort of the costs and the benefits of, of adaptation in terms of sea level rise um, as a result of climate change. Um, obviously, the outcome of the report is that indeed, you know, adapting early sort of will pay off. Um, but this is some of some of the examples of the, of the work that we're doing. Um, so um, Ankel already spoke a little bit about the process in terms of the data um, and, and stuff, but I think um, what's important to mention is that when we first started this exercise, it was sort of two and a half people doing it, Ankel and myself and some support from the JSC. And now uh, we have a whole team in the JSC in different locations working on it. We have a whole team in Mare. And we're working with all the other DGs because what we realize in terms of the data and in terms of the information is that a lot of it you can find at DG level because it's very niche, um, because it requires a very concrete expertise. Um, and so that's the added value that we're working with all these sort of different actors to improve the, the quality of the report. Um, when we have our, our draft, we actually send it to consultation to uh, the different DGs uh, in, in the commission, but we also send them to the member state and to, to the stakeholders in the industry. And once again, this is because we not only want their feedback, but because they can provide information, they can, they can also be sources of data. And, and especially for the emerging sectors, this is incredibly important. Um, and I think now more than ever, uh, when we think of the blue economy, um, we really want it to align with, with the sort of the EU priorities. Um, and we think that the, the blue economy and, and consequently the blue economy report have a great opportunity to, to play a role um, in the European Green Deal. So we talk about the biodiversity strategy, farm to fork strategy, and certainly the sort of the energy transition. Um, as for the report itself, um, we think that, that accurate data, reliable data, comparable data are crucial um, to, to informed policy making. And so this, this is the role of the report to, to inspire investors and to support policy, policy makers. Um, and for that, the data has to be good and it has to be solid and it has to be reliable. Um, in terms of, of, again, the EU priorities, the decarbonisation um, strategies, the blue economy is, is extremely important um, if we think of alternative fuels and, and the changes that are going to take place in terms of managing transport and, and port activities, but also in terms of offshore renewables. Um, and, and from our, from, from, from our perspective, you know, we've got the offshore renewable strategy in place. Again, really, really key role for, for the blue economy and, and all of that can only be, be advanced um, if, if we have the data and we have the information to support the, the processes. Um, and again, we, we can't ignore sort of the, the, the big issues that, that the COVID-19 crisis has, has sort of led to, um, but we see the blue economy again as essential in, in, the, in the recovery path and in the green transition um, for the recovery path. And this sort of takes me to, to some of the, the next steps. Um, and for us, there's, there's the next steps in terms of the actual report. Um, so the next report will be published in, in May um, this year, coinciding with the European Maritime Day. And it will include the impacts of COVID. So there'll be an analysis per sector um, as regards the, the sort of the impacts of COVID, but also um, a little bit on, on the recovery and the, the sort of the impact and the effects of the mitigating uh, measures that, that have been implemented um, so far. In terms of the blue economy more, more generally, um, we have developed with the help of the JRC and the help of Digit, um, a, the blue economy indicators tool. This is an IT tool, the link is, is over there, but I'm happy to share it at a later stage. Um, it's essentially where we have all the data that is contained in the report, but so much more. It can be disaggregated, it can be filtered. Um, 
And there were several goals with this. One was to centralize the data because one of the issues we found when doing the report is that the data are just dispersed. Um, different sectors can be found in different places. So we wanted to, to sort of centralize all of that. So what, that was one of the goals, um, but also to make it publicly available, to make it user friendly, um, to sort of make it transparent and to give the possibility to extract and download. And this is in line with another um, European priority, which is the European data strategy. So, so providing data for the public to use and, and reuse, um, which is also important. Sometimes we collect a lot of information, but we don't get to communicate it to the public. And um, that, that's a shame, really. Um, finally, a few words on the Blue Observatory. So we, we realize the importance of satellite accounts for the blue economy. We see, we see key examples in, in Ireland, in Portugal, and of course in the US. Um, and in our view, it's important because we need more data, we need better data, and especially as regards to the emerging sector. So the European Commission and DG Mar recently launched a feasibility study um, to determine whether setting of an observatory um, at an EU level is in fact feasible. So, so we're uh, results are pending at the moment, but, but we're hoping that the outcome uh, will be successful. But, but that's sort of the the goal um, in the future. And I think that's pretty much all I had to say. So, if there are any any questions for Anke and myself, when we're, we're here. Thanks, Yasmin uh, and Angel. That, that was fantastic, a, a fantastic overview of, of the work going on uh, in the Commission. Um, yeah, so uh, just for the audience, uh, you know, feel free to add your questions to the questions and answers tab there. We're, we're taking questions uh, via text uh, and we'll, we'll uh, as we just so put them up at any time and we, we'll uh, present them to, to the speakers. Um, just one question, Would, what, what percentage of, of EU GDP do you estimate the, ocean, the, the, the EU ocean economy to be? If, if you have any. So, I, I can start and probably Jasmine will, will complement. So, well, this is, uh, there is a huge variability uh, in countries like Malta, uh, Croatia, Greece. Uh, this may reach a ten percent, very high, uh, very important numbers. Uh, the average, I think, is around two percent, right? Uh, yes, um, but we see that little by little is increasing. So at least in in, in recent years, huh? and more than that. Uh, there we are only taking into account the direct contribution and only the established sectors. If we take into account the emerging sectors, which are very difficult, as Jasmine said, to, to, to collect the data that we need, and also the indirect uh, impacts uh, in ancillary activities, we believe that the, that the impact should be massive. And actually, one of the objectives in, that we are now on the, on the table is try to measure the full size of the blue economy in the, in the EU. Yeah, okay. And, and, and Angel, maybe for you as well, just you mentioned that's the, you know, and, and we all deal with the, this, the NACE codes and the fact that, you know, a, a lot of them are not uh, uh, full of maritime codes, so you have to do a split there. But you, just, uh, you might say a bit more, I, I mean, you're using expert opinion to decide what that split is, if I, if I understand correctly. But, but who are those experts? Or, or is, is it within each uh, industry that you, you're using the expert opinion from to get those splits? Yes, well, I will start, and again, uh, Jasmine probably will complement my, my response. Uh, here we are based on previous studies that we have been undertaking, uh, based on um, the knowledge of experts uh, that, uh, of course, include also the, the knowledge and the, and the view from the industry. And these studies have been used to, to fit into this, um, into this uh, uh, split uh, between the maritime and the non-maritime. Of course, this, this is like a fixed photo. And I think it's time or we have to continuously um, update these numbers because the economy is something, something that we learn is that the blue economy is very dynamic. So this is, we are trying to do that and I have to, to really confess that it's difficult. Then on the other hand, we are engaged in discussion with Eurostat. Mm -hmm. Uh, as you know, uh, there is a revision going on for the NACE codes, 
And we hope that the next uh, revision for, from the statistical system in the European Union may uh, consider, may reflect better the, the size and the developments on the blue economy. Of course, these changes at, uh, uh, at uh, EU level, because we, we have to coordinate uh, 27 uh, statistical systems from the member states, take time. Eh? So we will see results in the in the in the medium long term but in the short term of course we try to to get the best available knowledge and that's why your work colleagues is fundamental to to help us and, and guide us yeah exactly i would i would just have to add that that um we do so this this was my point this is why we sort of try to involve all the other dgs and some of the stakeholders so to give you an example we've been dealing with with c europe as regards the shipbuilding sector for example and it's true that they have um, more concrete um, figures for, for the split. I mean, that, that's sort of the business. So, so yeah, we try to gather all of this information um, to, to every year review the splits we have and, and sort of decide whether, whether they're suitable or they, they have to be improved or they have to be modified slightly. So just a learning process and a work in progress, I would say. Okay, great. And actually, I see a comment there or a question. I think you've answered it anyway from our colleagues in the OECD, just asking about will you be regularly updating those uh, ocean splits uh, to identify more precisely the share of the ocean share uh, of the selected absolutely. sectors. But I think your answer there is yes. Yeah, I will. mean, it's, it's an absolute necessity. It's what Ankel was saying. It's a very dynamic sector. It, it changes. And so, yeah, um, and every course, year we, we oh, review that. Yeah, OECD, they're, they're working on this as well, obviously, and they're happy to exactly. happy to discuss those issues. Um, just uh, finally, just take one more uh, question here. Just, a, 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 yeah, we have a, a comment on, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, the integration of higher education strategies and funding uh, to address knowledge and workforce capacity to, capacity to support sustainability of uh, the broadest blue economy endeavors and, and just your thoughts on that. Uh, uh, do you capture that in, in the statistics? So in the um, higher education strategies and funding. Right. So, okay. So for us, not so much in the statistics, the statistics in terms of the established sectors in Eurostat, um, we do in the, in the report that will be published may have a chapter uh, devoted to research and education where we sort of um, address um, the investments and the funding that have been going to a lot of, of projects and also um, how we sort of uh, encourage blue skills and, and blue careers um, and making the link again with the European Green Deal and the green transition and how jobs in the sector can help us sort of move forward how we can create more jobs so so there'll be a whole there will be a whole chapter um, devoted to, to that this year yes okay that's great great to hear Okay, thank, thank you very much uh, for that excellent presentation uh, and for keeping to time. So we're going to move on to our, our next speaker. Um, uh, so going, to, going across the globe uh, to our, uh, our colleague, Dr. Wailing Song from the National uh, Marine Data and Information Service uh, uh, um, Institute in, in, in the People's Republic of China. And, and Wailing is going to be talking to us about uh, their revised national standards for ocean and related industry classification in China. So Weiling is a, an associate research fellow and deputy director of the Marine Economy, uh, Marine Economic Study Division at the National Maritime, Marine Data and Information uh, Service in the Ministry of Natural Resources in China. Uh, her research in, involves compiling an, an analysis of the marine economic statistics, marine economic accounting, and marine economy model development. And I know Weiling has been has been developed has been. Uh, Working on this uh, almost since since the first symp symposium, and I think I first uh, we first met even in that maybe at that first symposium, if I if I remember correctly. So so Wailing, I'm going to hand over to you, and, and thanks again uh, for for uh, joining us. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, it's very nice to have you here again to uh, join this symposium. And thank you very much for Stephen to hold this meeting finally in this hard time. And okay, uh, let's get to the topic. Um.
One minute for the. Oh, sorry. Let me try it again. Here. So I just I think there's a there's a share screen button at the bottom of your screen there, Wheeling. If you press that. Is it work? Can you see my screen? No. So if you press the share screen. Oh yes. Yep. This time. Perfect. Yeah. So that's it. Okay. Okay. Um, Great. Perfect. Okay. My my presentation is about the revised national standards for the ocean and related industry classification in China. Um, uh, today, I'd like to uh, present my uh, my work from these four parts: uh, the background the rules for the revising uh, the new classification and the influence after the revising of the industry classification. So first, uh, why we have to revise the classification of ocean-related uh, industry? Uh, you know that we have released our a national level classification of ocean related industries in 2006. Uh, that time we have done a lot of work uh, to sort out that what should be the framework of ocean economy from the industry uh, view. Uh, and uh, for now, it has been carried out for 15 years and uh, a lot of things changed, especially for the ocean economy. We all know that China has experiencing a very fast uh, increasing uh, improvement uh, in the recent years. So it do has some results in the ocean economy. For example, the marine engineering equipment manufacturing industry uh, and the uh, marine information service industry has emerged and grew uh, bigger and bigger. Uh, where well, the traditional industry like marine fisheries and marine shipbuilding industry upgrades uh, some way. So that's why we have to uh, revise our classification. So we can say from this chart that uh, our uh, marine industries in statistics is ever changing uh, from the six in 1992 to seven in 1996 and uh, uh, enhanced to uh, 11 in 2001. And uh, uh, in our um, uh, national level standard, uh, it comes to 12 in the major part in 2006. And now we are going to upgrade it in the greater one. Uh, the other reasons for us to revising the classification is that the national industry classification in China has changed a lot. Uh, you know that uh, the national classification we refers uh, in our 2006 version is the refers to the 2002 version of the national uh, classification. But uh, the national classification of industry has revised uh, twice, uh, separately in 2011 to 2017. So um, it is not suitable for us to stick to the old one uh, to collecting data of ocean economy. So we have to change accordingly. Uh, the last reason for uh, our revising is that we are prepared uh, to do the revising because we carried out the first marine industry survey during the 2014 to 2019. When we compile the ocean related inventory according to the marine industry classification. Uh, in that practice, uh, we just uh, judge every enterprises whether they are belongs to ocean economy or not. Uh, and which ocean industry 
it belongs to. Uh, so we got chance to get better understanding of uh, how our classification works. So now we are ready to revising the classification. So we can safely say that it is the high time for us uh, to revise the marine industry classification in China. So part two, uh, the rules. Uh, what are the rules we are following uh, to do our revising this time? Uh, I think this is a much interesting uh, part I'd like to share with you. Uh, during our revisement work, uh, we have um, summarized uh, four major rules to follow uh, when we uh, make this um, classification. First is the homogeneity of the marine economic activity. Uh, we classify the industry based on whether they are produce, producing similar products or offer similar service rather than the administrative area or accounting mechanism or authorized strength, uh, which means that uh, if, uh, if two enterprises are doing the similar product or offering the similar service, they should belong to the same industry. But uh, it doesn't mean that they are located in similar area. They should belong to the uh, same industry, right? And uh, it also doesn't mean that if they are sharing the uh, same accounting mechanism, they should be uh, uh, divided or classified into the same industry. Although they may be a little bit uh, easier to collecting data uh, if we classified the industry according to the administrative area or a con accounting mechanism, but it is the, the major or core rule of our classification. So I think this is the most important rule we should follow, but they, uh, they do have some, you know, appearance that we have to uh, make a little bit uh, flexible, flexibility, yes. And rule number two is that uh, we do have some particular uh, particularity of marine economic activities. Uh, for uh, one is that geographic homogeneity. Uh, for some special uh, industries like marine minerals and marine engineering construction, we have to use the location at attribute to judge whether it is marine activity or not, because the product has nothing different with the land uh, industries. Uh, the, it belongs to ocean industry only because it is located in, uh, in coastal area. Uh, so this is a very um, specific rules that we should follow uh, to some specific industries. And second the rule is that the relevance uh, for the marine related industries, we have to use the input output chain to find out uh, which industry is involved in marine economy activity. Uh, this is hard to find, uh, this is hard, hardly to find in the national classification. They do, don't need to uh, sort out the input output relationship in, or in their industry classification. But for us, for ocean um, industry classification, we have to use this method to find out the marine related industry. And rule number three is that the homogeneity of the basic unit uh, for some industries, uh, who has obvious marine characters uh, like marine fisheries, uh, they are all, all already uh, exist in the national industries. Those industries, we took the legal entity as the basic unit. The whole enterprises belongs to our industry. But for most of the others, 
um, the marine character are not clear, uh, which are hiding in the national industry classification. Uh, in this uh, circumstances, we took the establishment as the basic unit. For example, a big enterprises, they not only do uh, produce the ocean product, they also uh, uh, produce the product, uh, not ocean. Uh, for this uh, circumstances, we have to divide it, uh, this enterprise prices uh, into two parts, and we need to separate the ocean part from the whole part. And rule number four is the majority of the marine industry activity. Uh, if a enterprise is engaged more than one marine industry activity, for example, some uh, enterprises is, is both doing shipbuilding and uh, marine equipment building. Uh, for this uh, situation, uh, we need to judge that whether these enterprises uh, should be belong to, to which industry. And uh, then we, we use to, um, to we, we should use the, the, you know, other indicators like turnover and which has the bigger share in the products or the service, then we will bring these enterprises into this uh, industry. For example, uh, that uh, enterprises who produce shipbuilding and marine ship, uh, equipment, equipment manufacturing. If the, the uh, uh, turnover is uh, six, six, uh, 60 to 40 uh, in the turnover, then we should bring these enterprises into shipbuilding industry other than that, other than others. So now let's see the new classification. Uh, first, for the terminology, we didn't do any revising about the terminology of ocean economy. It is the same with the last one. Uh, for the industry, we do a little bit um, change. That we excluded the marine scientific research and the ma management and service from the ocean industry. So now the ocean industry is purely uh, including the core part or the, the, the yeah, core part of ocean and the ocean economy. And it can be classified into four aspects. Uh, first is to obtain the product from ocean directly, like fishing. And second is make the processing to the product that obtained from the ocean, uh, like fishery processing industry. Third is to apply it uh, directly to the ocean or ocean exploration, like shipbuilding. And fourth is to using seawater and ocean space as the basic element of its production, like uh, ocean transportation and um, seawater utilization, etc. So this is the um, latest uh, framework of ocean industry in China. Uh, it uh, is uh, divided into five parts other than two. Uh, one is the uh, marine industry, uh, which contains 15, uh, how to say, sectors, 15 sectors in them. And most of them, uh, they both including the traditional industries and emerging industries like um, marine medical medicine and biological products, etc. And the second part is the marine scientific and the re scientific research and education. Third part is the public governance and the service, which contains the marine governance uh, team and international organization, tax service, uh, information service, uh, bioenvironment protection and recovering, and the geographic pr prospecting. And the fourth part is the the last two part is the you know, re ocean related industry. And we divided it into two parts. One is the backward in the industry. Uh, the other is the forward uh, industry. Yeah, we just make it clear about uh, how it is related to the 
marine industry. And this is a comparison um, of our marine classification to the national classification and the international industry classification. We can say that we totally have five categories, 22 subcategories, uh, 121 three-digit code, uh, more than 360 four-digit code. And uh, here we refer to, we covered uh, 19 categories uh, of the um, national ec economic industry. And we also covered uh, 19 category of the international standard industry classification. Only two are not related to ocean economy, et cetera. And this is the uh, comparison between the old and new. Um, in the 2006 version, we only have two categories. Uh, we totally have 381 four-digit codes. And for the revised ones, we have five categories and totally 362 four digits code. Uh, although the, we, uh, we can't say too much changes from the numbers, but uh, actually we made 70% uh, revising or changes uh, during those 120 uh, three digit codes. And we made 80% changes in the four digit codes. So oh, yes, and uh, for time limitation, I only gave a brief um, introduction about some major changes uh, of our uh, industry classification. First is the uh, marine aquatic products processing. We separated this industry from the marine fishery. Uh, one is that one reason is that we are going to keeping keep it keep it with the change of national economic classification. And second reason is that it is easier to conduct the classification of a three uh, industry classification. Uh, we all know that this um, marine aquatic products processing belongs to the secondary industry, while the marine fishery belongs to the first fishery, uh, a first industry, so it is much easier to do the three, the three industry classification this way. Second industry is the marine engineering equipment manufacturing. We separate this industry from marine shipbuilding and marine related equipment manufacturing. And now this industry um, contains the following seven parts, uh, uh, including the equipment manufacturing of uh, marine mineral resources exploration and the development, the oil and gas resource exploration, the renewable energy um, development and utilization, sea water resource utilization, uh, biological resource utilization, and engineering general equipment and other offshore engineering equipment. All those equipment manufacturing belongs to this. Uh, industry and this industry is showing a very um, energetic power to grow now. And the third is the medicine and biomedical products industry. Uh, we just expanding the old marine medical medicine industry into this one, uh, and now it uh, includes not only the medicine but also the enzyme preparation, uh, green uh, agricultural biological agents, uh, biomedicine functional materials, bio-based materials, uh, marine cosmetics, uh, and other uh, marine biological products, etc. The last one I'd like to introduce is the uh, information service. Uh, we divided this industry based on the procedure of the um, of on the producing and the service a procedure of marine information service, including the uh, marine information collection service and uh, the transmission service and processing storage and integration of uh, the system and the sharing application service. 
and it shows it also shows a great power to to develop uh, recent years in China. So last part is the influence. Um, we have just finished our revising and it is still under the authorized uh, uh, checking and it will be um, uh, released uh, in June this year. And after that, we have to do some uh, changes accordingly. Um, first of all, that we should resharing the data with the National Bureau of Statistics and also do some historical changes uh, according based on this. Second, we need to improve the methodology of ocean counting because um, some industries are shrinking, some industries are expanding, some are reconstructed. So we need to uh, re improve, improve our methodology accordingly. Uh, third is that we need to revise the data collecting mechanism. You know, we have a whole uh, system to collecting the data. Uh, since our classification, industry classification has changed, so we need to do the revising uh, system uh, accordingly. Um, and last one is the planning and the decision making of marine economy. Uh, it also, it will, I think they should uh, sh shift all their attention from the traditional industries to the emerging industries a little bit based on our new classification. Okay, that is all that I would like to share today. Sorry, I, I use three more minutes and uh, that's all. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Weiling. That, that was really interesting. Uh, um, I'm, all, I'm always blown away by the level of, of detail you can get to uh, in your institute uh, compared to, to, to what we could get maybe here. Um, can, I, can I just ask maybe, uh, so your industrial classification codes, you said you, you're, you're changing them, but, but are you, do you have the ability to create new, uh, I mean, I'm thinking of the NACE codes we have here and then the Holy Grail would be to be able to get those four digit NACE codes for each and every um, sector or industry we want to analyze, but do you, are you actually doing that? Are you creating new industrial four digit codes? building a new a new system and we have uh, give them different codes in our ocean industry classification system and it is re written in paper uh, and we have made the comparison with um, with our classification to the national classification so we just not pick them from the national industry classification we build a new one that's why we could have our own course. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And and it, uh, so and and you mentioned the the, the um, these new or uh, sorry the marine related industries. So so again so if 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 I'm a manufacturer producing maybe I don't know sheets of plastic, they're going everywhere. But when I return my survey, I I'm expected to tick off and say, well, I I I think. Uh, I don't know, X amount has gone to the aqu aquaculture. Is, is that how it works? Yeah, I know. I think this is international, you know, hard work for us. Uh, so now in this industry classification, we just name it and list them. But actually we cannot give the specific data for each ocean marine related industry. We also use the input output multiplier to give a, a total number of the marine related uh, industry. So okay. that's, that's, yeah, that's hard. Okay, and then, then just, I suppose in terms then, we heard uh, from Angel and Yasmin about the, they're incorporating, trying to incorporate or build a picture about the ecosystem service values coming from European oceans. Is that a separate, I know you're, you're looking at this and are interested in this as well, but is that a separate, complete, kept, being kept completely separate from, from the, your ocean, uh, 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 the ocean statistics that you put out on an annual basis? Yeah, all I am talking about and uh, the work we are doing is only focused on the, uh, I'll just say the market, hmm. mar mar market, yeah. uh, market value. 
And for the non-market value, we just start the study. And I don't think they are they're ready and they are prepared well enough to, to incorporate with us because this system is very mature. Sure. And sure. We, we have public data every year, uh, even quarterly. Uh, but uh, for those, I think they, they have a long way to go to, yeah. to join this. Yeah. But we, are, we already start the, the, the study. And uh, because we are, we are merged into the uh, National uh, Natural Resources Ministry. You know, our our center is emerged into the uh, National Natural uh, Resources Ministry. So yeah. they are mm -hmm. paying more attention to the natural resources part. They and they ask us to study the accounting of the natural resources, etc. So yes. We have a lot of work to do there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, in, in the interest of time, we'll move on. But we have time at the end uh, of the session for for other questions. So, uh, anyone, any any other questions, uh, feel, feel, keep keep them coming. Um, so we're, we'll move on. We're staying in Asia, and we're we're moving over to uh, our colleagues in the Marine Institute of Korea, of South Korea. Um, and we've got Dr. Uh, Suk Woo Chu. I, I hope I pronounced that that right. Um, he, so, uh, Dr. Cho has worked as a director of ocean statistic uh, of the ocean statistics research department in, in Korea Maritime in Institute, um, which is a government affiliated research entity under the Prime Minister's office. He specializes in mathematical statistics such as quantile regression and non or semi parametric statistics. And he's been working on a, on, on a number of research areas uh, related to the National Ocean Economy Surveys. Uh, looking at technical efficiency and future risk assessments of ocean fishery industry and visualization of both structural and unstructural data. So, uh, uh, Dr. Cho, we'll hand it over to you uh, for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to share. That's perfect. Okay, it's perfect. Okay. Okay, hello, everyone. Uh, it's getting dark outside in Korea already. <laughs> okay, so this is um, um, Jake uh, from Korea Maritime Institute. Um, uh, that's why I'm using the, the, the middle name Jake <laughs> for you guys. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay, so and first of all, thanks for letting me have this uh, wonderful opportunity to present my work and share my experiences. Um, the topic I have brought today is the uh, status of Korea's ocean economy based on the National Ocean Economy Statistics Survey 2020. Okay. Um, okay, um, let's start with the, how it all began. Um, so the institute I'm in is um, a government funded and uh, policy research institute, um, mainly focused on the, the oceans and fisheries. But um, um, so simply we make uh, policies, but um, about um, 10 to uh, five to 10 years ago, everyone started to say evidence-based, you know, and uh, data-driven the policy establishment. And then, um, but there was, uh, at that time, there was a, uh, 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 literally little information related to the ocean economy in Korea. Uh, so uh, finally, the, the Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries, MOF, uh, in Korea, uh, decided to start um, create a new one in 2015. Uh, then we first make the classification system of ocean economy and then the statistical survey system uh, followed. Sorry, Jake, I think you, you oh. might want to go to the full screen there. Um, oh, okay. Uh, this is the, the, the one I'm looking at. Yeah. Okay, okay. Perfect. Okay. So, um, in early stage, actually, the, the marine lady industry, the, the sectors and the fishery sectors are the, conducted the, the, I mean, the built classification and conducted the, um, the surveys uh, separately um, in 2015. 
uh, and through the 2017. And then uh, finally, the, uh, the MOF, the, the Ministry of uh, the, the Oceans and Fisheries, decide to merge the two systems into one integrated um, uh, system in 2018. Uh, and since uh, 2019, so far we conducted um, uh, three annual surveys. So this is um, the, the classification um, system we use uh, right now. And um, um, this, is a how, the, the, this, is, this is how we merge the two, system, two, two systems, which is uh, marine sectors and uh, for the, the fisheries sectors. Um, and so basically we have uh, uh, nine the, the large categories and uh, the 29 medium categories and 68 uh, small categories and uh, 143 subcategories. So nine categories are the, the marine resources development and construction industry and the shipping and port industry, shipbuilding and offshore plant construction and repair industry, and fishery production, fishery processing, fishery distribution industry, and uh, oceans and fisheries leisure tourism industry, ocean, oceans and fisheries equipment manufacturing industry, oceans and fisheries related services industries. These are the, the nine the industries we have. Um, Is this is fair, okay. So marine resources development and consulting industry actually the, the involves the, the economic activities related to the, the production and extraction and processing of non-living resources in the seabed or the, the seawater. And also it includes the, uh, the construction in the ocean space. And the second category, the, the shipping and port industry is, um, <clears throat> It involves the, the economic activities you know, related to the transportation of flight and passengers through the ocean and river and um, the operation and management, management of ports. And third, the category shipbuilding and offshore plant construction and repair industry um, involves the, uh, the, the, the building, repairing and maintenance of ships, boats and offshore plat platforms and the, the OSVs, uh, all kinds of uh, the, the ships and the, the offshore the platforms. And fourth category is we have a fishery production industry. Um, it, it involves the fishing, aquaculture, and salt extraction industry and the fishery related service industries. And fifth one, the, the fishery processing industry, it, it is uh, the, the related to the processing of uh, seafood. And the fishery distribution industry, it regards the, the distribution of uh, seafood. And the seventh category is the oceans and fisheries leisure tourism industry. Um, it is uh, the, the economic activities related to the marine and coastal leisure and tourism, which includes mariners and marine sporting goods, retailers and zoos and aquariums, and the recreational vehicle parks and the campgrounds. And eighth one, the, the oceans and fisheries equipment manufacturing industry. Uh, it marks the, the economic activity, which includes manufacturing of marine equipment and materials, such as various um, machineries, uh, valve, cable, sensors, the ship materials, and so on. And uh, the, the last one, the, the oceans and fisheries latest service industry is um, um, economic activities uh, related to serve all kinds of services to support uh, the ocean industry, like uh, finance, um, R&D, education, consulting, and uh, technical services. Okay, uh, the next is uh, the... Um, how we process uh, the, the survey and use the, the methodologies. Uh, mainly the, the survey process um, consists of three steps. Uh, first step is preparation and the second step field survey and third part is uh, verification and analysis. So in the first part, um, we create a questionnaire and get a Statistic Korea's approval. I mean, the Statistic Korea is uh, the, the Bureau of Statistics in Korea and the build a population and design sampling scheme and determine sample sizes and the, set the, the survey guideline and train surveyors. And the, in the second stage in the field survey, the, we do the, the field survey um, and data codings and uh, the follow-up surveys if needed. And the third, <coughs> 
third step, uh, we estimate the parameters and uh, verif verifies and, uh, the, and analyze the, the, the data. And then the, the public, uh, we do the public announcement. So let's see the uh, each steps in detail. Okay, so uh, when we create a questionnaire, these are the, the items uh, we use uh, mainly. So basically uh, in the survey questionnaire, uh, we have um, representative information and period of establishment and the location of um, the, the firms and uh, type of type and size of enterprise and the sales proposal proportion by the business sectors and the number of workers, the wage and sales and purchase, import and export, um, all kind of R&D investment, investment attraction and uh, the business outlooks and so on. So these are kind of a uh, huge uh, the questionnaires we have and that makes out all the dip, uh, difficulties actually in the, when you do the you need to do the, the the surveys and the next step next uh, this diagram is actually shows you the how we gather the the, the national approval for the, the statistics so uh, we basically work with um, the the our instrument institute actually work with uh, all the, the government the, the ministry of uh, oceans and fisheries and also the uh, the, the Bureau of uh, Statistics in Korea. Uh, so basically, this uh, explains uh, how we did it get up the, the, the approval. And then the next one is uh, shows you how to uh, process the, the population building. Uh, so we mainly collect uh, the list, uh, all kinds of all available list, um, such as um, the, the enterprises list of uh, national enterprises survey, uh, which is conducted by the, the Bureau of Statistics. Um, so basically, we get all the list from the from them, and then also we use uh, additional list um, from the, the various organizations and associations um, related to the oceans and fishery sectors. And then also the, the, there are, there, are, there is um, important one more important uh, list uh, we use. Uh, it is a fishery license list. Uh, since um, the, the enterprise list from the National Enterprise Survey actually doesn't have many the, the, the enterprises uh, for the, uh, the uh, fishery sectors. So that uh, in, in case uh, to, to actually um, make up those uh, the missing the enterprises, actually we use uh, the, the license list. Um, and in the, the second step, um, we actually did extract uh, and we, we gather all the list and then the extract uh, the, the ocean economy, the, the enterprises uh, by the, the keywords, uh, the fish keywords that uh, or, or the related to the ocean economy. And in the third step, uh, we the, the, the dupe the duplicated uh, and uh, the integrated uh, by names of enterprises and uh, addresses, uh, representative registration numbers, and we use all these things um, to, to to clean the, the, the list. And then uh, we classify uh, the, the according to the classification system of the ocean economy. Uh, and after that, in the final step, uh, we, we finalize uh, the, the population. Uh, <clears throat> We reflect uh, that the, the, all the closed businesses using other the open sources, the, the, the ICE, and that is, a, is kind of a credit, uh, corporate uh, credit list. Uh, and then the, we verify uh, all the list uh, uh, by the, the experts uh, uh, in each sector. And uh, with that, the, that's that finalized actually the, the population list. And so this is uh, this uh, this table is actually shows you the the uh, the, the results of population build build in the two, as of uh, two thousand nineteen. Uh, so we have overall we have uh, the one sixty seven thousand and seven hundred forty nine enterprises in Korea, uh, and so each sector has uh, the, the some amount of uh, the, the enterprises numbers number of enterprises and <clears throat> next is uh the how we process the, the sample design so basically some of these are the the involves have uh, some the technical 
the things. So may, I may uh, skip some of these and then uh, uh, maybe I summarize a few important things first. And so basically when we uh, design a sampling scheme, uh, actually we have a, a few things. Uh, uh, so basically we dispute uh, 9,000 samples according to the the stratification rules. Uh, the first rule we have is uh, the stratified all the 9,000 samples uh, into the 29 medium categories of uh, the, the, the classification system we have. And then uh, the second rule is we the, uh, the dispute the, the, the samples uh, into the, the uh, seven intervals of uh, the number of employees. Uh, and then the final, the third step, third stratification is uh, by the, the 17 metro programs. And uh, so we use those uh, three the, the rules uh, to stratify the nine, 9,000 samples. And then in the second, uh, in, and then uh, uh, for all the, the, the firms with more than 100, uh, here, um, this table may show you the better ideas here. Uh, so the, for the older firms with uh, more than the 100 workers, then uh, we actually the, the surveys all those uh, firms uh, so that we can stabilize uh, the, the, the estimated numbers after we estimate the population. So that, and then the, we distribute the samples to 29 medium categories uh, and make sure of uh, satisfying the, the less than 4% of uh, the, the, the relative standard errors. Here uh, we have, uh, uh, after we uh, dispute the full survey layers, and then we dispute um, the, uh, around the five to 6,000 samples into, to, to make sure that we have uh, less than the 4% of uh, RSE. Uh, and then uh, the, the, for the le leftovers, we actually dispute the, the, the uh, dispute uh, the, those leftovers to the other the important things so uh, we want to uh, see more detail in more details uh, so uh, this is uh, the result how we uh, on the, the how we the, the distribute the, the samples so there were the 9000 samples and then these are the each year uh, the, the sample number of samples for each sectors Okay, um, then the next uh, the step is uh, tra uh, train the, the surveyors. And the, the main purpose of the training the surveyors is uh, the, to minimize uh, non-sampling errors. So that's a, it, since this is a survey, uh, that's a huge issue actually. So, and the surveyors learn how to, to encourage uh, the respondents uh, the, the sincere answers during the, the training. And uh, in the field field survey, uh, surveyors uh, visit um, visit uh, the each enterprises and conduct personal the interviews, the man to man interviews, and if necessary, the, these uh, the personal interviews uh, can be replaced by the uh, fax or the internet. You know. Okay, and. Um, after the, the main survey, we reviews all the responses case by case. Um, uh, since it's a uh, nine thousand, it, it it actually the, the requires a lot of time. And uh, since it's uh, all the numbers, and you actually uh, tired, um, your your eyes will be tired. And then if uh, we find uh, some missing or the suspicious observations. Um, while we are reviewing the, all the data, uh, we discard or reinvestigate uh, the responses. So then make, uh, if, the, if uh, there is a problem, then we do some uh, follow-up surveys. Okay, the, um, this is a simple uh, the, the, the ways of the, the methods uh, to when we the, the, the calculate the weights uh, for each uh, estimate uh, and finally the, these are the the results uh <coughs> parameter estimation results uh when uh, from the uh, statistics uh, in uh, when we when we do the the survey in in 2020 so um here we can see the uh, 
we have uh, the, the enterprises, uh, 167,749 enterprises. And um, out of those, this number, actually the 98.9% 98 .9 of uh, the, the enterprises are the actually small businesses in Korea. And uh, establishment, establishment uh, since the 2010 accounts for the 52%, 3 percent, around 52 percent, and the uh, average working month is uh, 11.3 months, and average close day for month is uh, 5.6 days. And for the representative gender, the male is uh, about uh, 67 percent, and the female is uh, 33 percent. And this is uh, the employees. Uh, so as of 2019, uh, 1 million and uh, 12,000, 12, I don't know, 120,000 and uh, 199 workers, um, maybe probably the, the one about around the 1 million workers are were involved in the oceans and fishery industry and number of workers in fishery product, production industry is uh, about um, um, 49, 46, uh, uh, oh, I mean, 4.5, uh, the, the, Hundred million, hundred thousand, and followed by the oceans and fisheries related services industry is uh, two point five uh, hundred thousand, and shipping and port industry is one point four hundred thousand, something like that. And so, if you compare the uh, the the two thousand eighteen to two thousand nineteen, um, the the. Uh, the sectors, two sectors that you know, the most increased uh, in, in the number, the number of workers is uh, actually the, the oceans and fisheries related services industry and the fishery processing industry. So those two sectors are actually the, 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 the increasing and also the two the, the decreasing the sectors were the, the shipbuilding, construction and repair industry and the fishery distribution industry. So th those were actually the interesting part uh, what we found. And uh, <clears throat> next slide is uh, for the, the, the number of workers by status. So <clears throat> out of the representatives, uh, uh, out of the, the all the workers, uh, there were uh, 168,288 uh, representative. And uh, for the full-time workers, there were the, the Four sixty-eight thousand and five hundred five fifty-five. The, the full-time workers and um, the interest part is uh, there. Were, there is a uh, quite a big number in the for the the, the temporal, temporary workers and those temporary workers actually uh, for the, the the fishery production the industry, uh, especially the fishery production industry uses uh, those uh, short-term short-term daily workers. So. Those are uh, the huge number in the temporary workers actually belongs to the fishery production industry. And um, <clears throat> other workers by the, the nationality and gender. The, by nationality, there were the, around uh, 1 million Koreans and uh, um, 100,000 foreigners. Uh, and um, the, by gender, there are 7334 men and um, about uh, 30 point, 34% is uh, was uh, the, the women and the interesting part is uh, actually the the number of foreigners actually increasing um, it is a quite quite increased uh, by uh, one year, actually from 2018 to 2019 and also by gender actually the the female employees uh, actually did, did increased a lot. And the, the last slide that I have probably uh, for the research is uh, that the business performance as of uh, 2019, the sales in the ocean and fishery sector amounted to the, the $157 billion and the purchases in the ocean and fishery sector amounts to the $90 billion. And, and it is uh, actually accounts for the 57.5% the, the of sales. And the export uh, value of ocean and fishery sector was uh, more than 
30 billion dollars and um, it is actually the 19.4 percent of sales oh i have more okay so business performance um the, the business cost was a uh, 143 billion dollars and business profits was a uh, 13.9 billions and value added was uh 66.9 billions and the capital in the ocean and fishery sector amounts to 72.9 billions and liability amounted to the the 106 billion dollars uh, and actually the, the capital in the ocean and fishery sector was uh 40 percent of uh, the, the whole assets and um this is uh the, the business outlook uh 2000 20 the, the business outlook is uh the negative 23.4 percent compared to 2019 so basically this is uh the, the how we the encountered the, the the last year of the, the corona 19 issues so the actually the firms and the enterprises actually the, the anticipated uh, the the 23 plus percent of uh, the decrease uh, compared to last year and then for the 2021 uh business outlook is a uh, negative 9.8 percent compared to the previous year the 2020 so um that's uh, how the, the enterprises actually feels uh, in the in the field and the, 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 the this is the, the summary uh, the, the, so the, the number of enterprises is um the, around uh, 170,000 uh, in 2019 uh, which is uh, the, the 4% of all enterprises in south korea and the sales amounts to the the 17.3 billion dollars uh, actually this is the, the, the typo um, so Sales is about one hundred fifty-seven point seven the, the billion dollars, and um, it is account for two point nine the percent of the national sales. And the number of workers, number of employees is um, the the uh, one around the one million and uh, the uh, um, twelve thousand. I mean the one hundred twenty thousand. Okay, and then it is actually consists of 4.9% uh, of an all national employees. Okay, so that's all, uh, all I prepared for today. Uh, and um, thank you for listening. And if you have any question, please let me know. Thanks, Jake. Uh, we're running slightly behind the time, so we might hold off on the most of the questions until till the end. But yeah, hopefully we'll have some time. But uh, yeah, very very interesting to see. I think in, in a lot of uh, the countries in Europe, uh, and uh, I think you'll see from the the the, the blue economy report from the from the European Commission. Uh, uh, marine tourism and leisure would be probably the the biggest uh, industry but from, yeah. from your work it seems uh, um, shipping shipbuilding that, that's the number one industry in terms of output but so employment it, it's the fishery fisheries related industries uh, have the highest employment figures uh, uh, so that's that's interesting to me um, but uh, again the level of detail that you you're able to go into is just amazing um, what, just uh, the the surveys that and the, those you went and talked to was it a, was there a legal obligation for for the enterprises to participate in the surveys once they were selected? Um, not actually, it, it is uh, not legalized uh, to answer the, the, the all the questions. But um, uh, still, that's a, that, that's a kind of a big hurdle when you do the survey. So make sure that we have all the answers and uh, and it's not just the answers. I mean that they they have to be get the answer the sincerely so uh, that's a uh, biggest challenge for us and then uh, for the, the first question actually the for the the sector for the the the, the leisure tourism industry actually uh, we do not include um the whole the 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 housings uh housings or the the the, the food restaurants the in the, the ocean areas so we don't we do not care about uh, we, we actually the, the not those are not included in our survey so that's the probably makes the two the, the big difference between the the, the oecd's legal oecd or eu's research and the, the in the, our results okay 
Okay, and I, I know I see there's a number, a number of people are interested in looking, is, is, is there a report written up on this? Is it available somewhere for people to get more detail? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it is, it is uh, the, the announced thing, uh, the, the, in the, the, statist, uh, the, the Bureau of Statistics in Korea, uh, they have uh, the, the website uh, to release, uh, announce all the, the, the data. So we, you can the, the, the search the, for our the data there. We might, we might get a, li a link from you afterwards that we can share. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. It's difficult to find that for some of us. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay. okay, thanks very much, Jake. Uh, and we're going to move on to our final speaker in this session, uh, uh, Ethan Adekot uh, from the Yale School of the Environment. Uh, so Ethan, you're very welcome. Uh, and Ethan, I suppose, is going to bring uh, some of this together in terms of how do we make this uh, this type of data more usable uh, to policymakers, even the general public? I suppose in terms of educating the general public, uh, and uh, so he's going to Ethan's going to talk about digital dashboards for ocean accounts. Um, sorry, I got my notes together here. Um, yeah, so Ethan is is in the last throes of of his uh, doctoral work at the Yale School of the Environment and the Environmental and Natural Resource Economic Group. His research focus on natural capital asset valuation management and accounting uh, and like i said he's been doing some really interesting work in, in terms of these digital dashboards i know uh, when they first appeared a colleague of mine in, in the marine institute in ireland was quickly on to me saying have you seen this or why aren't we doing so can't we do something like this so so i'm really interested to to, to hear about what you're doing and how it, it, the, these dashboards can be used so i'll hand over to you ethan hey, hey, ethan thanks all right, thanks, Stephen. And um, I know many of you will be familiar with the concepts I'll discuss today. Uh, in fact, if you're following the hashtag Ocean Accounts on Twitter, you'll find a link to the EU dashboard. And there's also other dashboards that uh, have popped up over time, um, the SCAP dashboard. Uh, NOAA in the US has an eNow portal that I know Charlie was involved in. Um, and so let me get my slides queued up here. Uh, Hopefully that's working. And as, as Stephen mentioned at the outset, one of the kind of developments and hopes of late are satellite account summaries that expose sectoral pressures on ocean resources. Um, <clears throat> and developing satellite accounts is obviously a barrier to exposing some of this. So this talk will uh, recount an effort to pull existing data on economic activity and environmental indicators to develop a, a summary for decision makers that's transparent, accessible, uh, and dynamic. Uh, Charlie's introductory remarks mentioned um, the kind of new coat of paint that the blue economy gives existing efforts to do this, but to assess progress towards sustainability, we have to move um, beyond just production account measures and something like ocean GDP. And so this will show kind of one way to integrate maybe environment and ecosystems via physical stock accounts, um, showing multiple or a plurality of indicators about the status of the ocean economy, which is important because we need to move towards um, capturing changes uh, in physical stocks and in the accounts and away from just these one-off valuation efforts for the ocean economy. Um, so as, as Stephen mentioned, I'm a doctoral candidate at the Yale School of the Environment uh, studying resource economics. When I first gave this talk, one of my goals was to motivate the utility of dashboards to folks as, as tools. You know, these dashboards are really awesome tools for articulating multifaceted information in a way that's quickly digestible. Amid the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, unfortunately, digital dashboards have stepped into the spotlight as a means of distilling, you know, large spatial and temporal data sets for both policymakers and the public. At the global scale, uh, large headline indicators can be important drivers of change, but at the local scale, these indicators can leave you guessing as to whether or to what degree that single headline indicator is relevant to you. Uh, and so we've seen firsthand how a single headline indicator can be misleading. Case information uh, here in New York City, um, you know, isn't as informative without information about, say, testing rates. And so, Today, COVID data, for example, are presented to policymakers and the general public as a dashboard of spatial and temporal indicators that can be aggregated and disaggregated at scale, uh, that can be tailored to specific areas and, and locations, uh, different time scales. And it just wouldn't make sense to combine all of this information about positivity rates and so on into a single metric. These dashboards facilitate rapid comparison of indicators that can't be aggregated into a single metric, um, which enables national ocean accounts for, for the use of national ocean accounts to co uh, coherently present 
both kind of monetary uh, accounts data as well as say physical accounts data that might not integrate as well into a headline indicator. Um, and so we've heard a lot in this session about um, efforts to do ocean accounts and about the boundary decisions that are being made, which NACE codes uh, to include, for example, in your accounts, or the need to revise classification of marine industries. Um, maybe a bigger question about how far inland our ocean accounts should extend. And so today, uh, I'd like to provide an overview of how uh, we envision a dashboard like tool being used and focus on a process to enable these boundary decisions about what to include and how far inland to be resolved by decision makers and free statistics officers from potentially making these normative decisions about where the boundaries fall. Uh, so I'll describe the dashboarding approach instead of having to motivate it. Uh, unfortunately, I'll explore this proto dashboard that we made for an ocean account in Norway using uh, existing data, you know, not asking for more data to be collected, but using existing data um, to do so. Uh, I'll discuss kind of the guiding principles that we came up with as we were uh, putting this together, resolve some concerns that we foresee in their use, uh, and at the end, um, you know, provide the link and share information so that folks can get in and play around with our tool. Um, although I know that there are these, you know, many of these tools uh, in existence uh, now. So first kind of what does it look like to produce a satellite account for the ocean economy with headline indicators? And I think um, many of us have, have been tasked to do this, uh, asked to do this task. And, you know, if you were doing this in 1962, um, the response probably would have been something like, how many years can you wait for it? How many reams of paper do you want it on? And how many staff do you have to read it? Um, you know, fast forward 20 years and the same data can be assembled on a series of floppy disks and in somewhat shorter time, another 20 years and, you know, information's probably downloaded onto a CD or two and maybe a thumb drive. And uh, today, such satellite accounts usually exist as a series of data tables, uh, usually zipped up and sent via FTP or mirror sites or using cloud storage solutions. Uh, if raw data are sufficiently large, the limited files are used, but the data are still presented in tables and in static printable formats. Even though these data are in digital form already, the ability to operate on the data, for example, to figure out imputed prices for ocean capital is largely a bespoke process. And while we still think and work in terms of data inputs and summary outputs and headline indicators that can be printed out um, and not algorithms that we can solve you know, these problems at scale. And so that, that should be the focus. And so our vision for kind of ocean accounts into the future uh, our dashboards to provide ocean account summaries that go beyond gross domestic product, go beyond the production account, and enable users to choose what is and isn't included in the production boundary. Uh, we'll show that they can be implemented today in, in such a way as to assemble raw data from multiple agencies to create bespoke indicators uh, and satellite account indicators that give a broader picture about sustainability. And this is a realization of the call in the stiglitz send fatusi report for a dashboard to present multiple summary indicators and provide a broader picture of well-being towards sustainability. New but not really new technology enables the realization of this recommendation for interactive data dashboards that help address boundary and aggregation challenges through their flexibility. Ocean economy dashboards are crucial for blue economic development and increasing the use of existing data and existing ocean accounts. For example, the uh, EU, the Portugal satellite account of the sea, as well as elevating non-GDP indicators for policymakers and the general public. And so my task as a part of this project was uh, to use existing uh, available data uh, and publicly available software. And it took about six weeks alone to create a, a kind of functioning proto dashboard that captures more than just the production uh, accounts and, and kind of value added. Uh, and so what I'd like to do now, and I hopefully this populates here, but I think I will uh, share the online version just because working this through PowerPoint sometimes uh, gets a little laggy. So hopefully folks can see this. Um, and I'd like to kind of walk through a couple of the pages and explain some of the features and then I'll kind of come back and, and talk about uh, the guiding principles we use to create this. Uh, so you'll see, first of all, multiple indicators here. Um, this is tagged to base year 2016, just so that the um, full suite of the data that we have um, is kind of in its full complement up to 2016. Um, 
that can be updated kind of without too much effort. And actually before the talk, I, I pulled some more live data and we have a couple more years of data added into the, the back end of this. Um, so this is uh, linking live using an API to existing data from um, various uh, locations on the Stats Norway website. Um, it allows us to here kind of choose a couple of the broad sectors that we might want to include uh, in the ocean economy. But again, this tool also allows policymakers and decision makers to see what these headline indicators and what these different indicators about the different components of the ocean economy might look like if we were to exclude one of these, say, NACE codes or one of these sub-industry headings. Uh, and so if we wanted to look at, um, for instance, over here on the left, the percent change from 2016, uh, 2006 to 2016 in, say, the value added in the economy, so the uh, measure of the production accounts, um, you know, just in the fishing and aquaculture sector, sector for instance. Uh, we click on this, uh, the dashboard will, will populate live, there you go, and we can see that um, the production accounts, you know, here uh, increased by 31%. Um, then I'll kind of turn your attention to the middle indicator, which looks at, say, the income accounts. Uh, and so a change in income accounts calculated from, say, wages um, uh, and other receipts gives you, you know, an 86% in, in, in kind of returns to income. Uh, while at the same time in the fisheries and aquaculture sector, we have an increase in the productive base of assets and in kind of the balance sheet. Uh, and so with these kind of three components, uh, we move away from thinking about just something like GDP uh, for the ocean and into a broader picture uh, of well-being, measurement, and sustainability. Um, these allow us to ask different questions, different temporal questions over time, uh, and to actually see how uh, the production boundary changes in addition to changes in the, in the um, balance sheet. Uh, and so here the balance sheet's growing, but production is down over this time period. Uh, we can dig into an input-output table by industry. Um, and slice in, in in kind of an interactive way in the same way that say the the EU dashboard uh, allows you to slice into different sectors. And so we can pick a year, we can pick a sector and disaggregate this data uh, to different levels. Um, one thing I'd, I'd, I'd like to kind of point out here is that if we're interested in say uh, fisheries and the value of fisheries, we can look at economic values of particular fish stocks over time. Uh, we can select a fish stock um, and this is again for Norway and look at the change in the value of the fish stock over time. Um, but if we want to actually know what the physical account looks like, we can explore that data side by side in a kind of quick and interlinked way so that we not only look at the value of the fishery, but also say the proportion uh, of spawning stock to total stock uh, in terms of biomass. And so coupling these data hand in hand allow us to take, you know, physical accounts that exist um, and create a space for potentially monetary accounts that for fisheries here exist, but may not exist for all resources and for all sectors that we might want to include in the uh, dashboard. The other feature that we thought was interesting and, and would be useful is to list things that policymakers might want, but that we just didn't have data for. And we thought this was important because it allows opportunities to say, you know, just as we heard earlier, this is a place where we need to go and collect data. This is a place where we need to focus our attention. Um, allowing the policymaker to select something that you don't have data for might actually be a really useful tool um, for leveraging, say, political engagement in, in, in developing these efforts. Um, the last piece I'll mention, you know, in addition to the balance sheet uh, that we just saw for, for the quantity of fishery stocks, is we might also have data that, as I said, we can't integrate into a single headline indicator, but might be important to track in addition to changes in, say, the uh, produce, you know, gross value added for a particular sector. So if we're interested in how changes in, say, pollutants, just in stocks of pollutants that we observe over time, might correlate with changes in fish stocks, changes in fish values, and even in a particular location, these digital dashboards allow us to do that. And so that's just kind of a, a quick tour of um, the dashboard that we created. Uh, again, just me and, and, and kind of six weeks to put together. And so let me... Um, hop back into the slides here uh, and discuss some of the kind of guiding principles here. But uh, hopefully what you've seen from the, the dashboard here um, is that we have, you know, the production account, an income account, and an asset account um, that give a broader picture of, of what's happening in the ocean economy. And this dashboarding technology, again, you know, 
allows national statisticians and other analysts to focus on the data and the algorithms rather than on the final headline indicators and, and rather than creating this iterative uh, dialogue with, with policymakers that might slow down uh, a process, whereas decision makers can choose fit to purpose boundaries uh, for particular policies and for particular regions. So the technical details of this uh, project, I used, um, you know, Power BI, which is a Microsoft suite of uh, a tool in the Microsoft suite of products, but uh, there are free versions of Tableau and other platforms that are pretty point and click. On the front and back end, these platforms also have the ability to add in bespoke R, Python, and virtual basic code. Um, and this particular dashboard calls publicly available data uh, live in JSON format um, and, and kind of manipulates it to create. Um, uh, common units, for example, or maybe to, to chain back to a particular um, nominal currency, uh, nominal value. Um, all this manipulation, aggregation, and filtering that we did was done in real time, and it can be paired with AI to answer sophisticated questions using natural language processing, like, you know, how many kilograms of herring uh, were caught in 2008, for example. It also supports geospatial uh, information and display formats that we can dig into particular areas and draw, you know, different uh, geographic boundaries around the ocean accounts. Uh, our hit list of things to do if we had more than just the six weeks to put this together um, was uh, to include greater sectoral disaggregation. And we talked, we heard about the importance of that earlier in this session. Uh, again, including geospatial data and visualization, uh, as we've seen, is, is particularly useful in some of the dashboards that the public's had uh, to use over the, the last year. Um, moving beyond just the publicly available data sources to increase scope, scale, and resolution, um, there's little additional effort to onboard more data into this. Uh, the effort's going to be um, harmonizing the data. Um, but as we see, showing a plurality of indicators allows us to kind of caveat those uh, and enable policymakers to view those decisions, uh, those data for decision making uh, at the same time. Uh, and lastly, adding tools um, to assess shadow prices for natural capital and ecosystem valuation to further marry those physical accounts uh, into the valuation changes over time. So uh, quickly kind of our guiding principles for putting this together, we wanted to organize existing information, show where there wasn't data that we might want to expose gaps in knowledge. Uh, this will facilitate kind of within and across country comparison at different scales and place that information directly into the hands of policymakers on, say, an iPad instead of a printed report. Um, single indicators rarely cut it for complex systems. And, and as I said, ocean GDP doesn't answer questions about the asset base or well-being, only the production side. Uh, would you trust a pilot who only looked at airspeed, for example? Right. In reality, airplanes have advanced cockpits that display different data in different modes and can be rescaled based on changes in the landscape below. Right? The pilot always knows the distance from the ground, even if they fly over mountains. Um, this same principle kind of led us to our vision for creating this in the first place, which was to have at least three national accounting indicators presented uh, as a starting place because GDP doesn't provide sufficient summary information about the state of the accounts. Um, including balance sheets, uh, having those balance sheets, you know, make room for non-produced assets, uh, including uncultivated natural resources like wild forests, or in this case, fish stocks, as long as they're not uh, pure open access. And, you know, almost no country is producing these balance sheets the way that they're, they're, they're supposed to be produced. Um, this picture is, is kind of what we envisioned a cockpit for a sustainable ocean economy looking like. Um, not to belabor the point, but uh, we have these three indicators because GDP is a static measure of output about how much a country produces and how, whereas income measures track these flows of benefits to people. Uh, and there's a sizable gap between the theory of what income is and what's currently called income in the SNA. Um, there can be a mismatch even between what policymakers ask for and what statisticians can provide. And these dashboards get us part of the way there by moving the aggregation decisions again into the policymakers' hands. Um, and, and kind of lastly, the changes in the balance sheet, you know, allow us to assess sustainability and the opportunities that we're passing on as asset stocks to future generations. And so as a reminder, this was kind of the implementation of that dashboard graphic that we came up with at the beginning. Um, a quick summary of kind of the benefits that I've mentioned. Uh, I'll say this uh, kind of last piece uh, here, which is just to emphasize that um, policymakers can ask deeper questions of the data when they're faced with uh, this plurality of indicators. Um, 
And so just to kind of skip ahead for the, for the purposes of, of time, um, if we only look at ocean GDP, we can only um, answer a limited set of questions. You know, multiple indicators mean that policymakers can ask and answer a richer set of questions beyond maybe um, questions like this. Uh, and so, you know, whereas we can only answer questions like how do ocean related industries create resources and products for use elsewhere and what jobs these industries provide. Um, good moving beyond GDP to other indicators allow us to ask broader scale questions and finer scale questions that span uh, different components of, of the ocean economy. Some quick concerns that we know folks have raised about using digital dashboards to present this information, both for policymakers and the public. Um, you know, one concern is what if, you know, today you look at the data and it says 2.1% uh, increase in the balance sheet and tomorrow it's 1.9, you know, how do we reconcile that? Uh, you know, data don't need to be uploaded continuously, even though the API might sync continuously for this one. Um, the reported headline indicators can be robust using kind of a default setting that reproduces headline figures that you might publish in a report, while allowing policymakers to drill down without a delay, without having to iterate back to these uh, national statistics officers. We know that some policymakers prefer paper, but the dashboard also has a static analog that can be printed out as a multi or single page document without particular additional effort. Um, for concerns that this takes you know, too many resources and too much time. I think the evidence that there are multiple dashboards that exist, you know, kind of since the first time we put this together uh, is evidence that that might not be the case. Um, this example that I'm showing leveraged existing data for Norway. Um, there are many software alternatives to, to create this. And again, it was a limited amount of time and a limited amount of resources on our, our end to put together something that, you know, already provides an informative view of what's happening in the Norway ocean economy. Um, you know, over a couple of decades before 2016. Um, like I said at the beginning, I know many of you are familiar with the concepts and um, there are definitely still challenges to creating and deploying dashboards for ocean accounts, but these first steps are very helpful, uh, as you can see, and particularly actionable um, now that the public is uh, used to manipulating and using a plurality of indicators to make assessments about uh, you know, the status of um, health or the economy uh, or the natural environment. So uh, here's the, the link and a, a QR code um, to the Norway dashboard. If you'd like to go in and take a look at it, um, I'm happy to answer questions and I'm grateful for the opportunity to present um, with the wonderful folks that came before me. Um, this is uh, again, part of uh, efforts uh, from the UN high, high level panel on the sustainable ocean economy uh, and part of uh, a blue paper on national ocean accounts uh, whose lead authors are uh, my doctoral advisor, uh, Professor Eli Fenichel at Yale, Ben Milligan and Ina Porras, and also a special thanks to a co-author, Christine Kimmerstedt from Statistics Norway, who helped us navigate some of the publicly available Norway data. So with that, uh, I turn it back over to you, Stephen. Thank you. Thanks, Ethan. That, that was a really, really fascinating. Uh, I think you've shown us the future and what, what we need to get to and in terms of using the, the data we're all collecting. Um, and, and I think that's a, I was particularly struck by that comment you made about leaving some of the, these, um, what I call them, the areas you're going to clicking on for non-market values, for example, leaving them blank. So just highlighting the fact that this is, this is a hole in the data. Um, I'm very conscious of time now, so so we're 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 running behind. But um, I was just wondering, just on that actually point, uh, uh, Ethan, the do you, is there an issue though in, in getting that data in there? You know yourself, a lot of the ecosystem service valuation studies they're very project or or or, or site specific. So how do we get to a point where we're doing something like we're doing with the ocean economy statistics and and link and producing? coefficients that we can say, well, this is what the ecosystem service value attributable to, to this activity. Right. You know, having a platform to elevate um, these estimates for particularly local uh, values that, you know, you might expect to be heterogeneous across uh, a larger, say, geographic area because of maybe particular interactions or uh, specifics about the ecosystem um, and the ecosystem services that are produced, just allowing those to exist side by side in tension um, you know, might motivate the types of changes that you're asking for. Um, and, and I'm not kind of going to provide a solution to that here, except to say that just like showing no data, 
um, showing the tension between different estimates uh, of the changes in value uh, and allowing those tensions to exist in kind of uh, a way where the assumptions that are being made about the boundaries that are included and the methods for producing those values are clear and showing that the underlying physical data that generate these coefficients are indeed the same, I think is a, a great step forward to um, you know, moving to better estimates in the future and a better vision of ocean accounts. Yeah. And I was just thinking there, I mean, listening, having listened to Whaling and Jake, I mean, if you could get your hands on their data, I think you, you know, you, you could explode what you could show here, the level of detail they have there, um, I think would be, would be fascinating. And also I was thinking from a marine spatial planning perspective, linking it in you know, at, at the European Commi Commission, they have EMODnet and that really detailed spatial information on these activities. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we would have uh, here in, 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 say, in Ireland, we'd have uh, the Marine Atlas. So, again, really powerful to link into that, to that in terms of, uh, of just, you know, I mean, I think it's all about you've shown how we can organize all these different sources of data and, and tell a coherent, uh, holistic, uh, uh, present a holistic picture, which is, is fantastic. Um, Okay, I, I think we're, I don't think we even have time for any more questions, actually. We're going to have to move on because I'm conscious I want to give people a break before we head into the next session at 11, uh, 11.20, uh, according to this. So I, I'm going to take a quick few minutes, a break. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, sorry, 11.40, I should say. You still have time for coffee. 11.40. Um, just to let everyone know, you, you would have been sent as a, a new um, Zoom link uh, button on the agendas, the agenda you would have been sent, sent uh, yesterday. So please uh, use that new Zoom link for the next session. Um, just I, I, maybe just to, I, I'm, just to finish up as well for, for some of the other speakers. Um, we heard from Jake, he, they, he had got to a point where he was able to say something about 2020 already in terms of you know, we all expect a, a downturn in terms of activity because of, of the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, but ha have, have, have you, Wailing or, or uh, Angel or Yasmin, have you been uh, also thinking about this? Or is, that, is it too early yet to say what, what sectors are, are going to be most affected or have been most effective, affected in 2020? Um, I mean, I can sort of uh, try to... Uh, and somewhat answer your question. Sorry, the, the connection was quite bad. Were you discussing the, the COVID impacts you were saying? Yeah, I was just wondering, yeah. are, you, are you at that point yet of having some information on the yes. sectors have been most affected? Yeah, so um, last year when we published the report, it was obviously around uh, April, May. Um, so it, we were right at the start of, of the pandemic. So we tried to, to assess what would be the impact um, but we have now sort of uh, reevaluated that because what we did notice was that some some sectors were sort of severely impacted at the time but um, were a lot faster in recovering now in, in the EU that's that in part that's due to um, you know some of the mitigating measures and, and the sort of the the, the funding from the side of, of the EU as well that went into for example the living resources sector um, but the idea this year is, is exactly that is to have a bit of an overview on, on the COVID impacts but also to assess it sector by sector so we'll have an analysis with some figures um, up until you know what we saw up until the, the end of last year um, especially for, for shipbuilding and for maritime transport um, where you have quite a bit of of data and in terms of that so yeah we'll, we'll include um, uh, quite a bit on that okay 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 here in china we just publish our data as euro and uh, last week we just uh, um, submit our uh, updated data of ocean GDP uh, in 2020 to our superior authorized. And we can see a um, decrease in ocean GDP in this special year, uh, but it is not published yet, maybe in next month or the end of this month. But I have to say that it's a Chinese version. We are going to do the translating uh, the English version uh, but uh, I don't think we are authorized to offer it. So I would try to figure out that what is the proper way to, to let the more people to get to know our data. 
Okay, okay. Thanks, Wayne. Um, Ethan, maybe just one, one final question for you there. There's a question on how do you ensure the data quality and comparability if very different public sources are being used for the dashboard? You know, this was an effort to take existing public sources um, because that's what we had access to. Uh, you know, I wasn't part of a national statistics office to, to do that. Um, you know, that I think is one of the things that we argue, you know, leaving the boundary decisions outside and allowing statistics officers to focus on the comparability and the quality of the data rather than on which data to include uh, and being tied up with policymakers wanting, um, you know, marine shipbuilding to be included or not be included for particular areas. Um, that's kind of the approach that we're taking. It, it's a very good question. Um, and, you know, again, we hope that presenting this in a clear way, uh, you know, allows us to be upfront. Okay. Okay, I think we're going to stop there and give people a, a chance to grab a coffee before the next session. Thanks to all our speakers. I really enjoyed that, that first session. Uh, and uh, I hope to see you all uh, again at 11.40 for session two. Thanks very much.